Take your Bibles, turn the book of Romans, chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. The title of the message this morning is The Sin Slide. The Sin Slide. You just about have to be under a rock not to have heard that on June the 24th, Friday of this week, the Supreme Court overturned, after 49 years, the decision of Roe versus Wade. I am very thankful that that has been done. The case that caused that vote to take place was Dobbs versus Jackson. I hope that becomes the term that we think of now instead of the term Roe v. Wade, Dobbs versus Jackson. Like yourselves, I rejoice that something that was so wrong has at least been moved towards the right. My daughter very wisely said, this doesn't stop abortion but it does make it more difficult in some areas which will cause more babies to be born and less babies to die. And I think that's a very accurate summation of what is taking place. Abortion has not been aborted. I wish that was the case. I wish that it was just now against the law for that to take place. But as I understand it, what takes place now is uh, the responsibility, the jurisdiction falls to each of the individual states. State of Alabama apparently already has a bill, or maybe it's already a law. I haven't kept up with it. Uh, but it either goes into effect or will go into effect shortly, which will ban all abortions in the state of Alabama. But by the same token, not every state is doing that. Uh, our three most western states, California, Oregon, and Washington, have formed what I will call the Death Coalition. Uh, they have determined that they will work together to make sure that abortion is accessible to all women, and they will also fight for the cause, what they call the cause of women's reproductive rights, and will devote much time and energy to that. On the national level, our president said it was a sad, sad day. <laughs> this past Friday. And then he encouraged folks to go out and vote for pro-death candidates. And I'm sorry, I'm not being nice about the terms. I'm just being very blunt with the terms, but for pro-death candidates. The, the vice president, uh, Miss Camelia Harris, made the statement. I said it wrong? Kamalia, Kamalia Harris, made, made the statement that uh, it's not over yet. And she's right, it's not over yet. The fine lady from Washington, Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters made the statement, and I won't say it exactly the way she said it, but she said to Hades with the Supreme Court, we will defy it. So we're a long way from being finished here, but at least something has moved in the right direction for some states at least. So where are we now? Where are we? That's what I would like us to address this morning. Where are we as a nation? Where are we as a people? As a matter of fact, I've got three questions I want to ask and answer this morning, all dealing with this topic, the sin slide. You're at Romans chapter number one. Our text is actually going to start down in verse number 26, but I'm going to give you the context, and I'm going to walk you through the context. First question that I want to ask and answer is, where are we now? Where are we? It's pretty easy to see where we are on the sin slide. For many decades, I referred to Romans chapter number one as the spiral of man's sin downward. Man's downward spiral. I suppose for decades I have referred to this chapter. Paul in less than half a chapter uh, describes how far down man will go in this spiral. But to be honest with you, I think I've about decided to quit calling it a spiral. A spiral indicates it takes time to go around. And it seems to me like nowadays we're much more on a slide. We're descending into sin more rapidly than I ever would have imagined it would have taken place in my lifetime. But this particular chapter makes it pretty easy for us to see what's going on and to see where we as a nation are in what's going on. Start with me back up in verses 20 and 21. I'm not going to read the verses, just notice some phrases in this verse. This is actually describing where the United States was in the early 1900s, early to mid-1900s. He uses the term there that we have turned away from our Creator. Verse number 20, uh, for the invisible 
things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. In verse number 21 especially, he's describing where we were in the early 1900s. We actually got to the place where we forgot the obvious. The obvious is everything has to have a creator. Everything has to have a creator. When that happened, we ceased to acknowledge God as God, as a nation and as a people, and at that same time, at that same time, we quit being thankful to our God. As a result of that, two things happened. Our vain imaginations began to grow. In other words, we started to think things that just aren't true. Do you understand that every wrong thought that we have as a nation now, such things as there are multiple genders, such things as uh, it's all right for men to marry men, such things as abortion, all of these things are an outgrowth from the fact that we first turned away from understanding that everything has to have a creator, our vain imagination began to grow, and our foolish mind, Paul said, began to get darker and darker. And it's not got yet as dark as it can get, or as dark as it will get. That's where we started at some years back. He goes on to describe the other things that took place. If you would uh, notice in verses 20. 2 and 23. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God in the image made like unto corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The wiser we thought we were, the more foolish we became. We became so foolish that we not only thought that God was like us, but we actually began to think that somehow we could evolve up to be a God. As a result of that, God lowered us a notch. Beginning in verse number 24, it says, God gave us over to our own uncleanness. Now, God didn't have to do that by putting thoughts into our head. Truth of the matter is, uh, God just had to stand back and let the sinful nature run its course. And the sinful nature did well run its course. We began to dishonor our own bodies, the Bible verse goes on to say. We began to expose ourselves and to begin to behave like animals. The 1960s were the year of the sexual revolution. It was because of the uncleanness of man, because we were dishonoring our bodies, that this thing called abortion had to be created, much like wild animals. If you continue to reproduce and reproduce, your brood will get so large that you can no longer take care of them. And so human beings and their lust for more physical contact and their lust for more lust began to conceive children. And so they had to do what farmers do with an abundance of animals. They had to take their offspring to be slaughtered. And for the last 49 years, somewhere around 60 million children have been taken to the slaughter. 60 million children. And yet we didn't stop there. The verse continues to describe what happens down in verse number 26. For this cause God gave them over unto vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and received in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. I noted in my notes as I was looking at that Bible verse, God allowed the sexual perversion that began to come into our country really in the late 1900s and into the early 2000s to come in. I say God allowed it. Men working with men, that which is unseemly. God allowed it. Throughout most of history, God has not allowed it. There was a time in the Old Testament when one or two cities began to practice that kind of behavior. We know them as Sodom and Gomorrah, and God said, no, I, I won't allow that. He sent two angels down to that place, and by the time those two angels left, that practice was not being done anymore. Down through the years, 
this kind of behavior has become somewhat common in many nations, but each time God would remove those nations. And to be absolutely honest, most of us Bible thumpers, as we've watched this kind of perversion take place in our country and in our world, we've kind of thought God would do some type of a judgment. It'd be a major judgment, but it'd be a selective judgment, like a Sodom or Gomorrah, where he picks out a area, a location, where some kind of terrible sins are taking place, and he would show his displeasure with that sin by judging those kind of locations. But it's been going on now for 30, 40, 50 years, and God's not yet done anything to indicate on a major scale that he's displeased with that. And some people have assumed that what that means is God's okay with that kind of behavior, but that's not what it means at all. The more we go without God showing his wrath in a specific area for those type of sins, the more I'm convinced we're actually living in the last ages. And God is saving his wrath up so that he can pour it all out on this planet all at one time. He's describing the downward slide of mankind. It started in our country. I think we could trace it back to the early 1900s when we began to take God out of our schools, out of our textbooks, out of our lives, out of our government. It continued down to the place where we became fools, thinking that somehow we could evolve up to God. It has continued to the place where we've had sexual revolutions and sexual perversions. But now we have, I think, slid down into the last area that this sex sin slide describes. Pick back up reading, if you would, please. And notice what he describes as the last area. Verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I think we've moved over into the reprobate stage. You say, preacher, what is the reprobate stage? The reprobate stage is the stage where we will not listen to the truth and we will not heed the truth. Even if the truth is proclaimed to us, we would deny it and we would refuse it. I think we have stepped across into a stage unlike any stage that we have been in before. And he begins to describe some of the characteristics of that stage. For example, verse number 28, he says, We do those things which are not convenient. Back in the 70s and 80s, when HIV began to spring up among the gay communities, some of the old-fashioned Bible preachers would preach that that was a disease that God was sending as a judgment. And they got severely chastened. And of course, there is no disease that just stays with one group of people. But that was a disease and is a disease that is still primarily propagated through that type of a lifestyle. Since then, we've added many others. Gonorrhea, hepatitis. Now this disease, monkeypox, seems to be coming through. And I've noticed they're not trying to indicate any longer that it's not related to that type of behavior anymore. And I suspect the reason why is because preachers have quit preaching that God is angry with these types of sins. And so the stigma of that type of behavior and that type of sin and that type of judgment may not exist. But I want you to understand, as kindly as I could say it, God does still judge sin. And we still get involved in things which are inconvenient, things which are wrong, but despite the disease and despite the death, the reprobate mind continues to do them. I don't think we're entering into the reprobate stage. I think we're firmly into the reprobate stage where the truth is right before us, but we will deny it. And if it's before us and we can't deny it, we will excuse it. He goes on to describe the characteristics of this reprobate stage. It's a time when we do things that are inconvenient, denying the truth. Beginning in verse number 29, he goes on to describe it as a time of exceedingly great sin. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, implacable, unmerciful. Do you get the idea why Paul is writing these things down? That he's got a very long list of behaviors that he's describing because he's describing a very wicked time period. 
this is the time period of the reprobates. It really doesn't matter how bad things get because their mind won't accept the truth, because they're unreasonable. That word implacable actually talks about them being ruthless, incapable of comprehending together. Uh, Because their mind is unreachable, no matter how bad things get, they just keep going in that same direction. He makes a statement in verse number 31 that I think is very understanding, very powerful. He actually uses that phrase, verse number 31, two things he mentions, without understanding and without natural affections. Without understanding. Seems in this age that we live in, that even inside the church, there's a lack of true understanding. When the verdict came down on Friday, I was aware of it pretty early, and I said, I need to stay away from the news, and I need to stay away from faith, faith book, because I'll start seeing things that will make me angry, and sure enough, sooner or later, I went back and started reading some things, and, and to be honest, reading what Maxine Waters said, that didn't surprise me, what Joe Biden said, that didn't surprise me, I understand their points of view, d- d- don't approve of them, but I understand them, but when I get onto Facebook and I start reading what Christians are posting online, uh, one guy posts, yeah, I'm pro-life, but I'm also pro-choice, and I'm thinking to myself, can you do that? Can you be pro-life, and can you be pro-choice at the same time? And then he went on to make statements like, uh, I don't understand how you can be pro-gun rights, and against abortion. And I'm thinking, well, you just wrote that you're pro-life and pro-choice. Something must be wrong with the way that you reason. The problem in the world that we're living in today is, even inside the church, there's a lack of understanding. As we're speaking, as we're speaking, three of the great Protestant denominations either have split or in the process of splitting. United Methodists, the Presbyterians, and it looks like the Southern Baptists. And it's not that uncommon for Protestants to disagree. It's not that unusual for for Christian ministries to separate and have problems. What is interesting is in all three of those cases, everybody that's splitting from the other, all sides are saying, we represent God. We represent the Bible. And I got news for you. You can't be on opposite sides of powerful issues like that. And everybody be right. The truth of the matter is, whether we're talking about inside the church or outside the church, people today are without understanding. We're living in the reprobate stage. Would you please notice how it ends in verse number 32? At least how Paul stops describing it. In verse number 32, he makes this statement. He says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We're in the time period where even if people do comprehend the truth and know that there's a God and understand that there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live, right actions to do and wrong actions to do, that many people just don't care. They're going to do wrong despite the fact that they know one day they'll stand before God for it. I don't think as I'm reading this Bible passage that it's that different from some of the headlines and the behaviors that I'm seeing take place around us. It would appear to me, if I wanted to place the United States of America in a place on the sin slide, I would have to slide him way down towards the bottom. Maybe not completely at the bottom, but getting close to the bottom, for it certainly seems like as a nation, we've not just spiraled down into sin, but we have slid down into sin. First question I would ask is, where are we? I think we're pretty far down on the sin slide. The second question that I would ask is, what's next? What's next? If this is Paul's summary of of the way the future was going to go, if this is Paul's description, not just of a, a nation, but a society of individuals, of families, of individuals and groups of individuals, if this is the way it works. If we slide down into the sin, what happens next? I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but chapter number two, verse number one, he's on a completely different train of thought. Uh, He gets to the end of the slide, and then he just stops. He doesn't tell us what's happening next. I'm curious. 
If this is our country, if we're going down the sin slide, what should we be looking for to take place next? Since Paul doesn't tell us, all we can do is guess. I have three thoughts. I think one of them is more probable than the other two. But let me share with you what I think the three thoughts are. Number one, I think it's possible that we could have a revival. I don't know about you, but that's what I am praying for. And by revival, I mean a spontaneous revival. I mean where the Spirit of God just seems to move across this land and where hearts become contrite and and where stubbornness is just melted and where people begin to realize, hey, I'm rebelling against the Almighty God and He's the Creator and His Son died for me on the cross. I'm thinking that if I could have anything that I wanted, what I would ask God for is that we'd have a spontaneous revival. If we could have some kind of revival like that, my kids could enjoy some older golden years. If we could have some type of a revival like that, my grandkids could grow up to see some adult years. If there's anything that I would ask God for, it would be that type of a, of a spontaneous, universal movement of God to bring us to the realization that sin is always a sin against God. I suspect you're praying for that kind of revival. I hope you're praying for that kind of revival. But then again, you look at the Bible, and you have to notice that biblically, most revivals don't happen spontaneously. In the Bible, most revivals come after God exacts a pretty great judgment on mankind. Just check out your Bible. Go back and read the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, there's revival after revival. And I'm not just talking about military revivals or political revivals or or judicial revivals. I'm talking about the people of God, the nation of Israel, realizing that they had sinned against God and calling on God for forgiveness and for help. But as you read through that book, you'll find out most every one of those seasons, and to my knowledge, every one of those seasons came to pass because God first brought a great judgment. You fast forward in the Old Testament to David. David, the greatest king that Israel has ever had. I think he'll be the greatest ruler that the world will ever see until King Jesus sits upon the throne. And yet before David came to the throne, Saul had been king. Saul wasn't the world's worst king, but he wasn't the world's best king either. And because he didn't serve God with all of his heart, God allowed the Philistines to come in. And the nation of Israel was a very beaten and oppressed and controlled nation. And that was the judgment of God on that time period after which David came in and a great revival took place. You fast forward to the time period of Ezekiel. Ezekiel during the Kings and the Chronicles. One of the greatest revivals that the nation of Israel ever had was during the kingdom and the reign of Hezekiah. Yet his father was one of the most wicked kings to ever live. Brought Israel down to the place where they were worshiping pagan gods. And God was so angry with Israel during his father's reign that he brought the Syrians down upon Israel and controlled and oppressed and defeated them. You even fast forward to the New Testament. And there Jesus calls 12 disciples, gives them the title of apostle, sends them out, the church out, And we have revival not just in the nation of Israel, but literally all across the globe. The gospel is preached from kingdom to kingdom, from nation to nation. Thousands, millions, perhaps many millions of souls came to know Jesus Christ. Yet we sometimes forget that the nation of Israel, before Jesus came, had already been under Roman control for 150 years. And before the Romans, it was the Greeks. And before the Greeks, it was the Persians. And before the Persians, it was the Babylonians. The truth of the matter is God had been judging the nation of Israel for 750 years before Jesus ever showed up. With such great judgment, at the end thereof came great spiritual revival. I think we're praying for revival. Oh, I think the people of God want to see revival. But I'm not sure we understand that sometimes before revival can come, judgment must first come. What happens after this time period of the reprobation? Well, I hope revival, I hope spontaneous revival comes. What else might happen? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. But I'm supposing as we're going down this sin slide, getting into more and more sin, turning further and further away from God, our imagination getting greater, our minds getting darker, I'm supposing the further down the slide we go, the closer to the tribulation we're coming. 
so that when we eventually sail off the end of that slide, we sail into that seven years of tribulation. In other words, Jesus comes, raptures the church, and the world is left to go through that time period of God's wrath all along. Of the two, I'm rooting for revival. I'll be honest, I, I, I like the idea of the rapture. Uh, the rapture comes, I'm saved, I'm going. My immediate family, all profess to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're going, but I've got some loved ones that aren't saved. And if I go and they get left, they'll go through that seven years of tribulation. It might be all good for me, but it won't be all good for them. And because of that, I'd a whole lot rather see it. A revival take place and even the rapture take place. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm excited about the rapture. If Jesus comes right now, I, I, I'm happy to go, but I'm thinking about those that'll get left behind and I would just prefer to stay a while longer and see a revival take place. What happens when we get to the bottom of this slide? Well, two possibilities right off the top of my head. There's, there's a revival, I, I, I like that. There, there's the tribulation, that's good because there's a rapture, but I hate to see what's gonna happen to those that are left behind. There's a third possibility, a third possibility of what might happen. You get to the bottom of the slide and things might just stop. You know, kinda like a car, a tire on ice in winter, just start spinning. Things might just stop. Things might just stop right here where they are, and we might stay right where we are for a while. We're going down the slide, and then all of a sudden, we, we just stop. Now, I, I told you there were three possibilities. Of the possibilities, I think this is the less improbabilities. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps there could be a rapture. I'm thinking perhaps we might just go into the tribulation. Uh, it's possible that things might stop, but I'm not thinking it's very probable things might stop. You say, preacher, why don't you think it's very probable? Two reasons. Number one, I don't think it's very probable because the further down that slide you go, like any slide, you pick up more velocity, more speed. And it's just naturally more difficult to stop. Uh, we're, we're accelerating into sinfulness now, in this time period, faster. We're going into places much more dark, much more wicked than we have gone into in my entire lifetime. And I'm thinking in the history of the United States of America and maybe even the history of the world. It's just kind of hard to slam brakes on when you're going so fast. I think one reason is because the momentum all seems to be down and it just doesn't seem like Anybody but God could put the brakes on and stop that downward momentum. But, but then I think for a second reason. The second reason I think it'd be, it'd be unlikely, it's possible, but unlikely that we could just stop and stay. This could become a plateau for us, a ledge, and we could just stay like this for a I think it's unlikely, probably because neither side really wants to stay here. I can speak for the side of the righteous, I'm not the best qualified candidate, but I can tell you, I don't want to stay in this world the way it is now. Uh, I'm grateful for what took place on Friday, but, but I don't want to stay in a world that's just increasingly moving further and further away from God. To be absolutely honest, I don't think God would be content for us to stay in a place where, where the world has turned away from Him, is blaspheming Him, is disregarding His Word. I think what God would have us to do if we're Christians is to do everything that we can to draw this world back towards Jesus Christ, to bring God back the glory, to, to, to go backwards up that slide, to, to somehow get a, a, a foothold, to somehow get a grip, and to begin to, to take this country back towards Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, I don't think I'd want to stay on a planet like this forever if it was the place that brought such dishonor to our Lord. But then again, I think I could speak for the wicked too, for the unrighteous, I don't think they would want to give up their sins. And I don't think most of those that are living in unrighteousness would be too happy for very long with the sins they're engaged in now. If you'll notice, the slide goes downward. We started off just simply dismissing God, giving Him His walking papers, thinking that somehow we could evolve into being God's, but we weren't satisfied with that for very long. Before long, we have our sexual revolution. We're, we're, we're exposing ourselves. We're living in uncleanness. We're dishonoring our own bodies. But even with that, we weren't happy very long, so we had to go down into the perversions. And we weren't happy with that very long before we went down into the reprobate area. And the truth of the matter is, 
It doesn't matter how much sin you get involved in, sin after a while just loses its flavor. And you always have to go a little bit deeper and you always have to go a little bit darker. And the truth is, I don't think the lost world will be happy staying on this plateau very long. The longer we're here, the more stronger they're going to want to go down. Truth of the matter is, I don't think we're going to stay on this level very long. But then again, there was last Friday. Last Friday, something happened that I didn't think would ever happen. I never thought our Supreme Court would even be open to entertaining a case that could possibly reverse Roe versus Wade. I've watched for 40 years. I've seen presidents come in who I said, man, they can do something. I've watched Congresses come in, conservative Congresses, and I've said, they could do something. And I've actually had the hope that some of them would, and then I've been very disappointed as I saw lack of courage, lack of commitment, or whatever it was, so that the system just stayed the same year after year, and more lives were lost, and more glory was taken from our God. And then, and then Friday, something unusual happened. Five to four was the actual ruling on the Dobbs versus Jackson. No, six to three was the ruling on Dobbs versus Jackson. Uh, reversing Roe versus Wade, the vote was actually five justices to four. How they split that way, I'm not quite sure. But five very courageous justices voted to say it's not a constitutional right that a child could be aborted. And I'm thinking to myself, is God, is God actually giving our nation a chance to stop for a moment and to look around? Is it possible that God has slowed the momentum on this downward slide just enough, not, not enough to bring revival? No political decision, no judicial system will ever bring revival to this land. It'll have to be a moving of the Spirit of God. But is it possible that God has slowed things down just enough so that something good might happen in this country? So that perhaps for a period of time, some people might look around and say, you know, we've, we've been on the wrong track. There is a God in heaven, and life is a gift from God. And to kill life is always a wrong thing to do. Is it possible? You know, we all know how the Bible's going to end. We know how it's going to end. We just don't know the timing. So I look at that, and I think to myself, maybe God has given us a little bit of a loss of traction on this downward slide. And maybe what God is doing is he's looking around to see what type of reaction this country might have if things didn't go further down. And then I'm kind of thinking, I'm not sure he's going to be very pleased with some of the reactions that he's seeing. I'm not quite sure that what our president and vice president and Congress people, some of them are saying is exactly what God would have wanted us to say. I'm not quite sure that even what we're saying inside the churches, some of the churches, is exactly what God would have had us to say. I'll tell you this, those five justices, they need our prayers. Those five justices have put themselves in jeopardy. They need the people of God to be praying for them. Perhaps, perhaps these are some of the last five patriots of America. The last five who would risk their lives for the well-being of this country. Maybe they're the first five of a new generation that's rising up. I don't know. The, the verdict is out on that. But I see where we are. And I see what might happen next. I'm really rooting for that revival. First question, where are we? Second question, what's next? Third question, last question, what should we do? What should you and I 
do. If this is a slowdown, if this is a reprieve, if this is a pause, whether it is or whether it isn't, what should the church of God be doing at this time? I can sum it up in one word. We ought to be praying. We ought to be praying like we've not prayed in a long, long time. We ought to be. What should we be praying for? Go back, if you would, and look at verse number 31. And notice Paul's description. I think it tells us some things that we should be praying for. Look at verse number 31. He says, they're without understanding. What should we be praying for? That the Spirit of God would awaken a conscience in the United States of America. I hope you understand. The question of abortion could never be settled in a courtroom. As long as there's women and men that want to end the lives of their children, as long as there's people that want to slay the unborn, no courtroom, no law, no judge can stop it. It may be illegal now in Alabama, but that won't stop some doctor from doing something behind closed doors. That won't stop some hack from doing something that'll put not only the baby's life in danger, but the mother's life in danger as well. If we're ever going to stop something like abortion, God's going to have to awaken the conscience of the people. The Bible verse says, without natural affection. Something's happened inside of our land when a mother and a father would want to end the life of their child. That conscience must be awakened again. Uh, not just the conscience, though. Again, in verse number 31, he talks about without understanding. Uh, God would have to move to awaken the minds of our country. I, I cannot comprehend how anybody could be more concerned about a, a snail darter in a, in a creek or an eagle's egg. And I'm not against taking care of snail darters and eagle's eggs, but I don't understand how somebody could understand that these animals' lives are precious and not understand that the life of a baby, even a preborn baby, is very, very precious. Somebody wrote some years ago, and I read it, we've got so much more technology now that proves that life begins either at conception or around conception. We've got 3D sonographs. We've got 4D sonographs so that you can see exactly what that child is doing and what he looks like months before he's born. You can see how he reacts to his mother's voice. You can see how he or she reacts to touch to sounds, to pain. You can see them as they're eating. You can see them as they're sleeping. You can see them as they're kicking. How can anybody not understand that life is taking place inside the womb? Oh, we need God to do something in this land. We need God to awaken the consciences. We need God to awaken the mind. But then perhaps most important, we need God to awaken their souls. The truth of the matter is nobody could ever slay a child unless there was a dead spirit on the inside. Unless they had not received the gift of life itself, the life that only Jesus Christ can give. Oh, we need the Spirit of God to move across this land and to awaken the conscience, and to awaken the mind, but to also awaken the soul, to remind us that there is a God, there's a creator, and he's a judge, and we will stand before him once again. I don't get to preach nations uh, to nations. I only get to preach to you. I don't know where you are in your life today. I hope you're not on the slide of sin at all. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you ought not be on the sin slide. If you are a Christian and on that sin slide, or if you're not a Christian and on that sin slide, you need to get off. Jesus Christ is the ripcord. He's the one that you call upon, not just to get saved, but if you're saved and entangled yourself back in the life of sin again, he's the one that you call 
to get out of the life of sin. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I've got good news for you. He died for you. If you've been the only person on this planet, he still would have died for you. And if you'll call upon Jesus Christ, I don't care what you've done, I don't care how many dark paths you've been down, how far the sin slides you've gone, I don't care where you are, there's a God up in heaven that loves you and wants to invite you to become his son or his daughter. There is forgiveness, and there is hope, and there is salvation. This morning, if you've never trusted him, I pray that you would. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. Lord, the words didn't come as easily as I would have liked them to come today, but I pray, God, that you'd speak to hearts. I pray, God, that you'd show people here how much you love them. I pray, God, that no matter what we've done in our past, and we've done some terrible things, that we would understand how free the gift of salvation is for us. It costs you everything, but, Lord, it's free to us. Save souls, change lives, do great things. Help us to become a more praying people. Father, we need that revival. 